Brothers and sisters, we welcome each of you to this worldwide broadcast for seminaries and institutes of religion, originating from Temple Square in Salt Lake City, Utah. I'm Kelly Hawes, an assistant administrator, and I've been asked to conduct today's broadcast. We gratefully acknowledge the cooperation and assistance of our associates from the many church departments that have made this broadcast possible. Thank you each for attending this broadcast. We extend a special welcome to the spouses who have arranged their schedules to be here with us. You are a very important part of this work, and we are very grateful for all that you do. We are aware that locally you have already commenced this meeting with an opening hymn and in invocation. Thank you. First, we will hear from Sister Julie B. Beck, the General President of the Relief Society and a member of the Church Board of Education. Sister Beck recently spent some time with a small group of teachers and their spouses. She feels deeply about families and was anxious to share her feelings with us. It's a great blessing for me to be with you, my wonderful friends in the Seminary and Institute program. Thank you for the service that you give throughout the Church and the world. As I have traveled in my Church responsibilities, I've met so many of you. In country after country, you are the ecclesiastical leaders and also the leaders and teachers of the rising generation. Thank you for all you do. A few of your number are here in the studio with me today representing you. These are seminary and institute teachers from the Ogden, Utah area, and we're so grateful to them for coming with their wives and, and husbands together to share this experience together. I, like President Irene, believe that you are living the law of consecration in your service to church education. It's a blessing for us to have the quality of teachers and leaders that you are helping our rising generation. You have a great responsibility and you have a position of influence in the kingdom. The, we know that um, we couldn't teach the rising generation with such effectiveness without you, those that are full time and those who are volunteers. Thank you, thank you, thank you. My heart swells with gratitude for all that you do. I've served on the Board of Education and the Executive Committee of the Board of Education for almost two and a half years now. And I've seen that every single teacher who is recommended for employment and every leader in church education passes through a review process that goes all the way to the First Presidency and how blessed we are to have that process. We are very interested in who is teaching the rising generation. A major financial commitment of the Church is the Seminary and Institute programs and the Church Education program of the Church. I've been studying again your Teaching the Gospel Handbook, and I hope that you're reviewing that also. This is a marvelous resource for you and all that you do. And right in the very front, it says that uh, religious education is education for eternity and requires the influence of the Spirit of the Lord. And I pray that we will have that influence with us as we review some things today. As I've mentioned, how carefully the First Presidency worries about every detail of church education, I have asked this question to the young adults I meet with. Why does the First Presidency care so much about the youth of the church, and why do they invest so much? I know how much money they spend on the rising generation. I know how many people are employed to take care of the rising generation. Why do they invest so much? As I've met with young single adults around the world, I ask this question, why do they invest so much? And in their focus groups and their firesides, these are the answers I get, and you should be interested in these answers. You might ask your own students these questions. But they say, well, we are the future church leaders. 
Education is the key to success. We need training so we can stay strong. Our testimonies are strengthened in our classes. We need to meet other great Latter-day Saint youth. We are the hope of the future, other ones say. And other ones say, we appreciate it. And another one said, well, they spend so much money on us because we're worth it. <laughs> I was very interested in those answers. And uh, you have to know that after asking for response after response, and most other responses are exhausted, do I ever hear, so I will someday be a better father or a better mother or a better family leader. Family is rarely on their minds. Their responses are generally about self. And of course, we know that this is the time of life they're in. They're living in a very self-interested time of life, but they aren't thinking about family. Now you have an objectives page. I've marked mine up with highlighters, but you have been sent out some uh, revised or updated objectives. And when you got these objectives, family was mentioned in them. It says here that your purpose is to help the youth and young adults understand and rely on the teachings and atonement of Jesus Christ, qualify for the blessings of the temple, and prepare themselves, their families, and others for eternal life with their Father in heaven. That's your objectives. So you're going to do that through your purpose of living the gospel, of teaching the gospel, and administering uh, in such a way that you will be strengthening parents and those families. There are a couple places that families were added. So uh, we're here to help with the Lord's purpose, as it says, to help them achieve eternal life. In Moses chapter 139, we have that famous verse. Would you say that with me, everyone who's listening? For behold, this is my work and my glory to bring to pass immortality and eternal life of man. We know that through the atonement of Jesus Christ, our immortality has been taken care of, but eternal life is our responsibility to assist with, and there are certain things we have to do. President J. Reuben Clark said this, and it's in your book, your chief interest, your essential and all but sole duty is to teach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ as that has been revealed in these latter days. So what is that gospel? And what is essential to achieve eternal life? We know that we cannot achieve eternal life without the ordinances and covenants of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. We find other teachings about living the commandments, serving, giving away all we have to the Lord. But all of those things are based on the covenants we make. And without those covenants, we cannot achieve eternal life. That's why we share the gospel and prepare missionaries because Heavenly Father says, all my children need to be taught and given an opportunity to make the covenants that will save them. That's why we build temples, because Heavenly Father says, all my children need an opportunity to make these covenants. And so we do vicarious work for those who have died. Heavenly Father wants every one of his children to have an opportunity. And that's why we teach the gospel to our youth, so they'll understand and make and keep those covenants that they have to have to receive, receive eternal life. So my purpose today is to talk to you about why the Board of Education wanted an emphasis on family in your objectives. Why would we want you to talk about family or understand about family when you're teaching a generation of unmarried people? So what we'll do here in this session is uh, do talk about three main things. We're going to review a little bit the theology of the family, threats to the family, and what we hope the rising generation or 
your students will understand and do because of what you will teach them about the family and everything else. So let's talk about, um, first of all, the theology of the family and why seminary and institute teachers need to understand and teach this. We basically, in the church, we don't always say this in the same words, but we have in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints a theology of the family. And it's based on the creation, the fall, and the atonement. I don't know how well your students understand that. They may be able to, re to recite the facts about the creation, but do they know that this is a theology of the family? The creation of the earth was the creation of an earth where a family could live. It was the creation of a man and a woman who were the two essential halves of a family. It was not about a creation of a man and a woman who happened to have a family. It was intentional all along that Adam and Eve form an eternal family. It was part of the plan that these two be sealed and form an eternal family unit. That was the plan of happiness. That's the plan of salvation. The fall provided a way for the family to grow. Through the leadership of Eve and Adam, they chose to have a mortal experience. The fall made it possible for Adam and Eve to have a family, to have sons and daughters. They needed to grow in numbers and grow in experience. The fall provided that for the family. The atonement allows for the family to be sealed together eternally. And it allows for families to have eternal growth and perfection. The plan of happiness and the plan of salvation was a plan created for families. I don't think very many of the rising generation understand that the main pillars of our theology are centered in family. When we seek, speak of qualifying for the blessings of eternal life, we mean qualifying for the blessings of eternal families. This was Christ's doctrine, and this is some of what was restored that had been lost, the understanding and clarity about family. Without these blessings, the earth is wasted. When did we learn that? Let's turn in our scriptures to Doctrine and Covenants, section 2. I find this very interesting. Section 2 in the Doctrine and Covenants is the part, the only part that we have in the Doctrine and Covenants that Joseph Smith recorded from his visits with the angel Moroni. And this is uh, what section two says. Behold, I will reveal unto you the priesthood by the hand of Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall plant in the hearts of the children the promises made to the fathers, and the hearts of the children shall turn to their fathers. If it were not so, the whole earth would be utterly wasted at his coming. How early did the prophet Joseph Smith understand that this was going to be a theology about family? He understood it when he was 17, and he began to be taught. What are the promises made to the fathers? Who were the fathers? The fathers were Adam, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Noah, those ancient prophets who understood the doctrine of eternal families. And uh, the promises of the children made to the fathers that the hearts would turn to their fathers. The hearts would be turned to their blessings of eternal life that they would have. These, this is talking about temple blessings, temple ordinances and covenants, without which the earth is utterly wasted. So if we teach about what's in every section of the Doctrine and Covenants, if we teach so that our students know all the rivers in the Book of Mormon, if they can name all the prophets of the Old Testament, 
if they can describe to you the pioneer trek and the history of the Latter-day Saints in, in, in the restored times, but they don't understand the promises made to the fathers and their part in it, it's utterly wasted. I would submit all of our teaching is utterly wasted if they don't understand the context that all of this is taught within. And the proclamation on the family was written to reinforce that. It was reinforced to talk about the family being central to the Creator's plan. Without the family, there is no plan. There is no reason for it. I'm not certain that every one of the rising generation understands that with clarity. So let's review a little bit now some of the threats to the family. We have to know what we're fighting against. And if our young people don't understand what they're fighting against, then they can't prepare for the battle. And neither can you. We see evidence all around us that the family is not important. It's becoming less important, important in all societies. We know that because marriage rates are declining. The age of marriage is rising. Divorce rates are rising. More than a fourth of all births are out of wedlock. We see lower birth rates, and they're dropping every year worldwide. Abortion is rising and becoming increasingly legal around the world. We see unequal relationships with men and women. A lot of cultures that uh, still practice abuse of one kind within family relationships. And many times a uh, career is, is uh, gaining importance over the family. We know from our studies uh, here at church headquarters uh, with the rising generation that our youth are increasingly less confident in the institution of families. They're less confident in their ability to form a successful eternal family. And because they're less confident in families, then they're placing more and more value on education and less and less importance on forming an eternal family. We know from visiting with them and conducting studies that they show a lack of faith in their ability to be successful. They don't see forming families as a faith-based work. For them, it's a selection process, much like shopping. They don't see it as something that the Lord will bless them and help them in. They also distrust their own moral strength and the moral strength of their peers because temptations are so fierce they aren't sure they can be successful in, in keeping covenants. They also uh, have insufficient and underdeveloped social skills which are impediments to them in forming eternal families. They, have, they all have cell phones. I haven't been to a country in the last three years in the world where every young person doesn't have a cell phone. They all have a cell phone and they all have an email address. So they're getting increasingly adept at talking to somebody 50 miles away and less and less able to carry on conversations with people in the same room. That's uh, difficult for them. We also uh, have the problem that uh, we read about in Ephesians, and you, you're probably familiar with this scripture. President Hinckley used it a lot. This is Ephesians verses six, or chapter six, verse twelve. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is the world our young people are growing up with. They're in this world where there is spiritual wickedness in high places. Policies are being made every day that are anti-family, and the definition of family is changing legally around the world. Also, uh, spiritual wickedness, we could call uh, attention to pornography which is rampant. The use of pornography among our youth is growing. And the new target audience 
for those who create pornography is young women. They are the new audience. And you need to be aware of that. There are uh, media messages everywhere that are anti-family. And our young people are very connected with media. Internet, TV, the things they get on their phones, all electronic devices are delivering anti-family messages to them every day. And increasingly, they're seeing no reason to form a family or get married. In spite of all the teaching you teach them, they're being desensitized about the need to form eternal families. Let's read about how this is happening. Let's turn to Alma 30, and this is um, Korahor. You're familiar with Korahor. And let's put the family lens on this to see, see how, how this stacks up with what you're hearing today about family messages. So Korahor, who in verse 12 was described as an antichrist, said in verse 13, O ye that are bound down under a foolish and vain hope, why do you yoke yourselves with such foolish things? Why do you look for a Christ? For no man can know of anything which is to come. Behold, these things which you call prophecies, which you say are handed down by holy prophets, behold, they are foolish traditions of your fathers. This is what our rising generation is starting to think about families. How do you know of their surety? Behold, you cannot know of things which you do not see. Therefore, you cannot know that there shall be a Christ. Ye look forward and say, Ye shall see a remission of your sins. But behold, this is the effect of a frenzied mind. And this derangement of your minds comes because of the traditions of your fathers, which lead you away into a belief of things which are not so. And many more things did he say unto them, telling that there could be no atonement made for the sins of men, but that every man fared in this life according to the management of the creature. If you heard that, you're the one that will... Get yourself ahead. It's because of your skills, your intelligence, that you will be successful. That's the media message they're getting every day. Another message, therefore, every man prospereth, prospered according to his genius. Get your education, be the best. Their TV shows that they're watching are competitive shows. They're seeing American Idol. The so You Can Dance, lots of com competition shows. So the more genius you are, the more famous you will be. These are popular among your youth. And that every man conquers according to his strength, and whatsoever man did was no crime. That's what they're hearing every day. Live the life that's going to make you happy. That's the media message that they're getting. And what I'm finding it interesting in verse 18, that he did preach unto them, leading the way the hearts of many, causing them to lift up their heads in wickedness, yea, leading away many women to commit whoredoms, and also men. But these messages that you're hearing, a lot of them are targeting your young women. Anti-family messages targeting young women. Satan knows this. He will never have a body. He will never have a family. And he will target those young women who create the bodies to come and who should teach the families. And they don't even know what they're being taught and the messages. It's just seeping in almost through their pores. Because Satan can't have it, he's luring away many women, and also men. And they're losing confidence in their ability to form eternal families. Korahor was an anti-Christ. Anti-Christ is anti-family. And any doctrine or principle they hear from the world is that is anti-family is also anti-Christ. It's that clear. They need to know. If it's anti-family, it's anti-Christ. And an anti-Christ is anti-family. 
So we're in danger of getting a generation like we see described in Mosiah chapter 26, where many of the rising generation don't believe in the traditions of their fathers. And they become a separate people as to their faith and remain so every, ever after. Despite all the money, all the effort you put in, they could be led away if they don't understand their part in the plan. So let's go to the question. What is it we hope this rising generation will understand and do because of what you will teach them? And what should you do about it? The first thing is you need to teach so they don't misunderstand. So they always know that every doctrine, every principle, everything you're teaching leads them to the fullness of the gospel. And the fullness of the gospel is found in the temples and temple ordinances and covenants and their eternal role. That is the full gospel. In the church, uh, we're taught that the primary concern is to teach the saving principles of the gospel. And the saving principles are those that are the family principles, the principles that will teach them to form a family, teach that family, prepare that family for ordinances and covenants, and then the next generation and the next. They have that responsibility. Let's be very clear on key elements of the doctrine. And I hope every one of your classrooms have a proclamation on the family there and that all of your students have a copy of the proclamation with them so that when you're teaching them, you can tie back teachings to key statements and phrases that are in the proclamation on the family. So that it's not just a standalone lesson. Here's a lesson on the proclamation. But if you're teaching in the Old Testament, this should be a partner piece that they're circling and underlining and finding where the Old Testament families understood these principles. If you're teaching in the Doctrine and Covenants, you can tie it back to this. Where did those principles tie back to what we're asking them to do? Book of Mormon. All, if they have this with them in their scriptures, they will be learning and tying it together as you work. President Hinckley said uh, in 1995 when he read the proclamation on the family in a General Relief Society meeting and revealed that to the church, that the proclamation was a declaration and reaffirmation of standards, doctrines, and pra practices that this church has always had. This is not new doctrine from 1995. It was a reaffirmation of understanding that was there since Joseph Smith understood it at age 17. One of those doctrines is uh, the, uh, the understanding of parents, sons, and daughters. President Kimball said this, From the beginning, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has emphasized family life. We have always understood that the foundations of the family as an eternal unit were laid even before this earth was created. Society without basic family life is without foundation and will disintegrate into nothingness. Elder Hale said this about marriage, the family is not an accident of mortality. It existed as an organizational unit in the heavens before the world was formed. Historically, it started on earth with Adam and Eve as recorded in Genesis. Adam and Eve were married and sealed for time and all eternity by the Lord. And as a result, their family will exist eternally. That's very clear, isn't it? President Benson said this, This order is described in modern revelation as an order of family government, where a man and a woman enter into a covenant with God, just as did Adam and Eve, to be sealed for eternity, to have posterity, and to do the will and work of God throughout their mortality. This order of the priesthood has been on the earth since the beginning, and it is the only means by which we can one day see the face of God and live. Elder Bednar taught us in his wonderful uh, message. This is, I recommend this to you for your study. This is Worldwide Leadership Training Meeting, Supporting the Family, from Sept February 11, 2006. 
he uh, gave a great message. There are other foundational messages here, one from President Monson, one from Sister Parkin, and another one from Elder Perry. Elder Bednar uh, quoted specifically about two important reasons why we have the family, why we have marriage. Reason one, the natures of male and female spirits complete and perfect each other, and therefore men and women are intended to progress together toward exaltation. Do your students understand that with clarity? Second reason for eternal marriage. By divine design, both a man and a woman are needed to bring children into mortality and to provide the best setting for rearing and nurturing children. Wonderful principles taught in here. We also need them to understand, this is your students, that the command to multiply and replenish remains in force. It's okay for them to bear children. That bearing children is a faith-based work. President Kimball said that it's an act of extreme selfishness for a married couple to refuse to have children when they're able to do so. The messages that are coming at your youth are anti-children, and they need to understand it's okay to bear children. Motherhood and fatherhood are eternal roles and responsibilities. I don't know if they understand that. That each carries the responsibility for either the male or the female half of the plan. That they're preparing in this life for those eternal roles. They're not just preparing their testimonies, they're preparing for eternal responsibilities. What we're really preparing them for is the blessings of Abraham. And we can review that in the Doctrine and Covenants, or actually the Pearl of Great Price, in Abraham chapter 1. Let's read this and ask ourselves some questions. This is uh, in verse 2, Abraham, I like to say, some people say Abraham was 100 years old when he was in here, but when I'm talking to young adults, I say, how do we know Abraham was a young adult male? It says, uh, because he saw it was needful for him to obtain another place of residence. <laughs> so... They can think of themselves. It's needful for me to obtain another place of residence. I don't need to live with my father forever. And Abraham in, in chapter 2, or in verse 2, said, Finding there was greater happiness and peace and rest for me, I sought for the blessings of the fathers. We often call Abraham one of the fathers. So who were Abraham's fathers? Adam, Noah, and the ancient prophets, uh, Seth, and those were the fathers he knew about, and he knew about their plan and their responsibilities. What is it? What were the blessings? He wanted the right whereunto I could be ordained to administer the same. Having been myself a follower of righteousness, desiring also to be one who possessed great knowledge, and to be a greater follower of righteousness, and to possess a greater knowledge, and to be a father of many nations, a prince of peace, and desiring to receive instructions and to keep the commandments of God, I became a rightful heir, a high priest, holding the right belonging to the fathers. Where do we learn about these things? in our day, and where do we receive these blessings? He wanted the blessings of the temple that were available to him, to become a rightful heir, to be the father of many nations. That blessing only comes to those who have a temple, sealing, and marriage. You cannot be a father of many nations without a wife that you're sealed to. And he could not hold the right belonging to the fathers without a wife, with the rights belonging to the mothers. So Abraham wanted and sought the temple blessings that we learn about in section 2 of the Doctrine and Covenants, that same priesthood. So who were the mothers? Do your young women know who the mothers were? They know that the mothers were Eve, 
and Sarah and Rebecca and those important women, the scriptures call Eve our glorious mother Eve. And why was she glorious? Because she understood her responsibility in the formation of eternal family. I love the story of, of Abraham and Sarah and of Isaac and Rebekah. And this is found in Genesis. Now, if Abraham wanted these blessings, his wife was pretty important. Abraham and Sarah had one son, the golden son, Isaac. If Abraham wanted these blessings to be the father of many nations, how important was Isaac's wife? Isaac's wife was pivotal in Abraham being able to receive his blessings. She was so important that he sent his servant on a mission to find the right girl. A girl who would keep her covenants, a girl who understood what it meant to form an eternal family and have those same blessings. And Rebecca, for all we know about her, and, and uh, it's a great study to just study what her qualities were. You can start in verse 15 and just read through uh, some time with your students and learn what were some of her qualities. What do we learn about Rebecca? What was she like? What was her character? that made her the kind of person to qualify to be the wife of the one golden child who was then going to pass on these blessings. But in verse 60, we come to the point where Rebecca was, she wanted this blessing also, and she was blessed by um, her uh, brothers, it says, uh, be thou the mother of thousands of millions. Where do you get those kinds of blessings? You get those in the temple. And Rebecca was blessed and wanted these blessings. So Rebecca left all. She wanted those blessings so much, she says, I don't need to wait. I'll go now. And she and Isaac formed an eternal family. They had two boys. One of their boys chose to marry out of the covenant. And we learn from Rebecca that uh, she was weary of her life because of the daughters of Heth. Those were the daughters that were not in the covenant. This is in... Uh, 2746, where she said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these which are the daughters of the land, what good shall my life do me? Now, Rebecca gave up everything. Everything. She left her family. She left her homeland to go form an eternal family because she wanted these blessings. And of her two sons, she had one left. And of the daughters of the land, there was not one who could form an eternal marriage with her son. And she needed to see that that righteous son got the blessings. Rebecca used her influence to see that the priesthood blessings and keys passed to the righteous son. It's a perfect example of the man who has the keys and the woman who has the influence working together to see that they're prepared. But now we had Isaac and Rebekah, who knew about the promises to be the mother of the thousands of millions or the father of many nations. And, that, and who, how important was the wife of Jacob? Very important. Because of Rebecca's influence and Isaac's priesthood keys, we got the 12 tribes of Israel, which now people the earth. That story of Isaac and Rebecca is pivotal. It depended on a man and a woman who understood their place in the plan and their responsibilities to form an eternal family, to bear children, to teach them. So what I submit to you, one of your responsibilities is, besides teaching those doctrines so they don't misunderstand, 
send forth from every classroom Isaac and Rebecca. If we could have every one of your children, every one of your students understanding their roles in this great partnership, that they are each an Isaac or a Rebecca, and they know with clarity what they have to do. Next, what I would have you do is I would have you live in your homes, in your families, in your marriages. Live so your students have the hope of eternal life from watching you. Your objective is to live the kind of a home that they want to have, have that kind of a family. They won't get that message from many, many other places. But if you live it and teach it with so much clarity, what you teach will cut through all the noise they're hearing and pierce their hearts and touch them. You don't need to compete in volume. You don't need to compete in numbers of words. You just need to be very clear in your examples. You are the ideal for them. If you can live at home so that you're brilliant in the basics, that you're intentional about your roles and responsibilities in the family, you think in terms of precision, not perfection. Perfection is difficult to obtain in this life. But if you live your family life with precision, you have your goals and you're precise in how you go about them, that in your homes, they learn from you that you pray, you study the scriptures together, you have home evening together, you make a priority of the meal times and teach your family in those times, that you are constantly teaching your families the things you're teaching them. Speak respectfully of your marriage partners. And from your example, the rising generation will gain great hope and understand through your example, not just from the words you teach, but from the way you feel and emanate the spirit of family. Seminary and institute objectives are to prepare our youth for the blessings of eternal life. Let's review now where we've been in this teaching time. You're preparing them for the temple. You're preparing them for eternal families. Without which the earth is utterly wasted. There are many threats that are coming at the rising generation, threats to their forming an eternal family, and they're being hit with those and losing confidence in their ability to form eternal families. In a lot of ways, they're similar to Abraham, living in a land where there is idolatry and wickedness, and they need to mentally take themselves out of that into the land where the Lord can bless them to receive the covenants. Your role in this is to teach them so they don't misunderstand. To be very clear on key points of doctrine which you find in the proclamation on the family. That this is prominent in your teaching, prominent in your classrooms, prominent in what they're learning. That you're preparing them for the blessings of Abraham in everything you're teaching. You're preparing them for the temple that you're seeking to send forth from every classroom an Isaac and Rebecca, and you're living so they don't, they have confidence in you, and through your example, they know they can form eternal families. Oftentimes with young adults, I'll, I'll tell the story about the day my husband and I were married, that we had three dollars, and even worldwide, that's not very much money nowadays. It was a faith-based work when we got married. We didn't get married because of money or because our education was complete or because we even had a place to live. We moved in with Grandpa and took care of Grandpa for the first season of our marriage and went to school and worked hard. But we entered that relationship as a faith-based work. And we knew that we had formed a covenant with the Lord and He would bless us. And it didn't take money. It took faith. Those are messages they need to have um, and get confidence of because of you. This generation 
will be called upon to defend the doctrine of the family as never before in the history of the world. If they don't know it, they can't defend it. They need to understand temples and priesthood. If you don't know that they are meant to be fathers and mothers, then they won't know that they are meant to be fathers and mothers, and the effort will be wasted. President Kimball said this in 1980, so this is almost 30 years ago, and I find it uh, prophetic and very applicable to us. Many of the social restraints which in the past have helped to reinforce and shore up the family are dissolving and disappearing. The time will come when only those who believe deeply and actively in the family will be able to preserve their family in the midst of the gathering evil around us. There are those who would define the family in such non-traditional ways that they would define it out of existence. We, of all people, brothers and sisters, should not be taken in by the specious arguments that the family unit is somehow tied to a particular phase of development a moral society is going through. We are free to resist those moves which downplay the significance of the family and which play up the significance of selfish individualism. We know the family to be eternal. We know that when things go wrong in the family, things go wrong in every other institution in society." Close quotation. My brothers and sisters, my wonderful friends and partners in this work, we talk of Christ and we preach of Christ and His full doctrine, His doctrine which is based on the theology of the family, and we are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ or his doctrine. We are willing to defend it and teach it with clarity. And we know as we do so, we will have heavenly help. Our covenants make it possible for us to live with Heavenly Father eternally. That is our great blessing. I leave with you my testimony that the gospel of Jesus Christ is true that it was restored through the prophet Joseph Smith. We have the fullness of the gospel this day. I bear you my testimony that we are sons and daughters of heavenly parents who send us forth to have this earthly experience to prepare us for the blessing of eternal families. I bear you my testimony of our Savior Jesus Christ and that through his atonement we can become perfect and equal to our responsibilities and our earthly families, and that through His Atonement we have the promise of eternal life in families. I bear you my testimony of the power of the Holy Ghost to be with us and guide us in all of our teaching, and that if we call upon that power, that power will pierce the hearts and souls and minds of this generation which are hungry to learn the truth and they will recognize it because they did receive their first lessons in the world of spirits. It will ring true to them. We are led today by a living prophet, President Thomas Monson. I also thank each of you for your dedicated service, your lives of faith and consecration, and your living examples of the truthfulness of this gospel. I pray the Lord's blessings to be with you in all you do in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Beck. We are grateful for each of our families and for the precious role they play in the plan of salvation. We would now like to take a standing break for a few minutes as we watch a message from our colleagues throughout the world. President Hinckley had a way of always uh, giving you a question that, you know, just you never relax in a meeting with him because you never know what he was going to ask. And one day we were in the Board of Education meeting, out of clear blue sky, President Hinckley said, Stan, why does seminary and institutes of religion exist? Why do you people exist? What's your purpose in being in the church? <laughs> and uh, that, of course, made, made your mind go blank. 
But I said, well, President, if I understand the mission that you have given us, we in church education are to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ to the youth of this church out of the scriptures, from the words of the modern day prophets, and to teach them in such a manner by the spirit that these young people will gain a testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that they will have desires to go to the house of the Lord, that they will have, particularly the young men will have a desire to go on a mission, and that they will ultimately have a testimony of the gospel and be happy, contributing, successful Latter-day Saints who ultimately desire to achieve the celestial kingdom where they can dwell with their Father in heaven and the Savior eternally. And when I finished, President Hinckley said, Stan, and he, he always had the, when he wanted to make a point, he always pointed a little finger at you, and he said, Stan, that's exactly why you exist, and that you make sure is in the hearts and minds of every seminary and institute teacher in this church. Do you understand? And I said, yes, sir. Our purpose is to help the youth and young adults a entender y confiar en las enseñanzas y la expiación de Jesucristo. Understand and rely on the teachings and atonement of Jesus Christ. A se qualifier pour recevoir les bénédictions du temple y prepararse a sí mismos a sus familias y a los demás for eternal life with their Father in heaven. As I read your new objective that you're putting together now, uh, we're still on target. You're still doing exactly what the prophet said we ought to do. And I commend those who have worked on this new objective because you're not strayed from the past. You've held to the rod. You've done all that you should have done. And now by the spirit, you go out and teach it. And the young people will be receptive to hearing it. We will now be pleased to hear a panel discussion that is moderated by Brother Randall Hall, the Associate Administrator for Seminaries and Institutes. Following the panel discussion, we will be honored to hear from Brother Chad Webb, the Administrator of Seminaries and Institutes of Religion, who will be our concluding speaker. We are all very grateful for him. He has a great love for the Lord, for each of us, and for the students that we teach. At the conclusion of Brother Webb's remarks, this broadcast will close with the hymn and benediction as previously announced by your local leader, Brother Hall. Brothers and sisters, welcome to our panel discussion today. We're here to visit about teaching and learning, especially as it relates to the seminaries and institutes of religion. I would first of all like to introduce our wonderful panel. To my far right, we have Kim B. Clark, who is president of Brigham Young University, Idaho. Seated directly to my right, Elaine S. Dalton, who is the Young Women General President of the church. And next to her is Richard I. Heaton, who is the director of the Provo Missionary Training Center. We're so grateful that they are willing to take their time to be with us today. And I'm Randall Hall, the Associate Administrator for Seminaries and Institutes. As I mentioned, we're going to visit for a little while about teaching and learning and the youth of the church uh, to help us learn more of the things that we can do as seminary and institute teachers to bless the lives of these precious souls who are in our classes. So I'd like to begin uh, with asking maybe a general question of the panel. What have you learned about the process of teaching and learning that might help us to take the gospel into the hearts and lives of our students? Anyone like to respond to that? Well, let me just make one, one observation about, I like the word process because I think it's important to understand it is a process. My experience has been that, uh, especially when we're teaching the gospel, but really when we're teaching anything, all true teaching is done by and with the Holy Ghost. So everything that we can do to help our students have the Holy Ghost with them, and everything we can do as teachers to have the Holy Ghost with us, will 
greatly increase the power of what we teach because the Holy Ghost will teach it and carry it both unto and into the hearts of the students if they're really prepared to hear it. And once it gets in there by the Spirit and they've had that spiritual experience, it changes their lives. And that's, I think that's our objective as teachers is to change their lives have their hearts changed by the power of the atonement and get the spirit into their, into their hearts. Excellent. Thank you very much. I Sister think Dalton. I have to absolutely agree with President Clark because um, I think that's the biggest thing that I have learned about teaching is that we're not teachers. We're really, we're really facilitators that invite that spirit. It's the Doctrine and Covenants, Section 50. Uh, and the other thing that I have learned is that we can learn by study but also by faith. And when, when you have that combination, it's really a great combination for learning because you can study, but then you can learn by faith. And as we know, faith is a principle of power and also of action. And so when you, when you study or teach in that way and help the young, young people learn by study and by faith, they act, and when they act, it, it goes into, I think, more into their hearts and into their lives, facilitated by the Spirit. Yeah, that, I, I'd like to just echo, if I could, maybe from a little different perspective, these wonderful comments that have been made. Teaching, in one sense, can be defined best by whether or not something was learned. It's one thing to stand up and talk and to, to pontificate, if you will, to share what one knows, but it doesn't really matter unless someone on the other end learns, and as you know, the Lord says in section 50, it's not only the teaching that has to be done by the Spirit, but the learning must also be done by the Spirit. And so, as a teacher, the, the, the greatest secret is to forget yourself enough that you can tune into those students and see, are they really learning? Are they really grasping? And looking for evidence of that as you go through the process of teaching and learning. And I think that involves agency, personal agency on the part of every learner. Because I think that the youth really have to be exercising their agency um, in a way that they decide to allow the things that you're teaching, yeah. or they decide to act, or they, they decide to be pure enough to let the Holy Ghost touch their hearts. So. Yeah. They have the right to veto any, any, any the greatest of teachers. Yeah. Yeah. By Every, choice. Everything that you've said about agency puts a really interesting responsibility on the teacher. So it's how do you create an environment where students can exercise agency and, and uh, act in order to uh, authorize the Holy Ghost to teach them? And that means that teachers, as they think about how can I help the students have the Holy Ghost more powerfully in their life, it becomes a question of, well, how can I create an environment or experiences where they can exercise their agency. And one of the things that I think is so powerful, uh, we see it in the, um, in the way missionaries are taught to teach, is teachers inviting students to make a commitment, to take some kind of um, purposeful mm -hmm. action. Um, so, and it happens even, in, uh, even when you're teaching calculus. It's really anything where you, you invite the student to, to, to make a commitment, to act in a certain way, or to undertake a certain set of activities by committing to do it. And in that action, the student then opens their minds both to the spirit and to the experiences they're about to have. And that's how they learn. I love the idea that learning involves changing the way our brains work, changing the pathways that are, that are in our brains. But in, in, when we're talking about the gospel, it also involves changing the way your heart works, the, the kind of pathways of your heart, where your desires are, where your commitments are, where your values and principles are. And I think when we give students the opportunity to exercise their agency, it sort of opens them to change in their hearts and in their minds, and is, is, a, is an amazing thing to watch. 
because it's it's really the you can really see the work of the Lord going on in that person. Are there other things that a teacher can do to help establish that type of a climate? I think I think a teacher uh, one of the main responsibilities of a teacher is to establish a climate wherein revelation can be received or establish an environment wherein the spirit can operate. And I think that begins with the teacher. I think that in order for us to teach, we have to be pure enough that we invite, we, our, very, our very lives invite the, the spirit with us. And then the spirit takes over. The learners have to be pure too. And, um, and, and thus, you know, the emphasis we have in young women on virtue on being pure enough because in I think in this world that that things are too slick and too glitzy and too glamorous to really know when you make a choice where that will lead you sometimes but and so it's critical that the Holy Ghost play the primary role what I hear you saying is and I don't know who coined this phrase it certainly wasn't me but in gospel teaching we teach who we are even more than what we know so if we're a learner, if we're seeking the Spirit, if we're seeking to... None of us have mastered any of the gospel principles, not one of them. Mm-hmm. And we, if, if we approach this, if we approach our role as a teacher, as a learner, that we're trying to learn and we're, we're, we're seeking revelation and inspiration. We want to know more about this. We want the students to join with us in this quest to know more about this. Then we teach who we are. And that has a greater chance of the students joining with us in that journey. Absolutely. You know, you asked, Randall, you asked the question about uh, how do you create the environment. I think there's a passage in the Doctrine and Covenants that gives us some, just a really powerful insight into that question. It's in the 88th section. comes after the Lord has taught the prophet about learning by faith and about preparing ourselves. And then there's this wonderful phrase where he says, above all else, clothe yourselves with the bond of charity. Mm-hmm. It's an interesting phrase, above all else. And he's talking about teaching and learning. And, said, and the message is, the most important thing you can do in that classroom or in your family or wherever you're teaching is to establish bonds of charity. And that word bond, um, it kind of reminds us of covenants. And that leads you to the salutation in the school of the prophets where the Lord instructs us to say, you know, I am your brother forever, fixed, immovable, and I will be your brother and I will love you and care for you. And I think the reason why that's so important in a classroom setting is that in a classroom like the one we're talking about, you are trying to get students to act by speaking, presenting, talking, bearing testimony, sharing experiences. And that can be a little bit scary. Unless you're in an environment where you know that the people love you and you're loved and that no matter what you say, even if you make a little mistake or you don't get it quite right, People won't jump down your throat. They'll love you and you'll be okay. So you create a very, um, almost a safe environment where you're psychologically, emotionally, spiritually safe. And, and teachers are the ones who really do that uh, by creating, as Sister Dalton said, and but he said in their, in their lives that they come and they love that's why teachers need to have the pure love of Christ, that they love their students and the students feel it. So then they're saying, well, I'll raise my hand and say, well, this is what I think, or, well, I think this is what I would do, or this is what I think this means, or I had an experience and here it is. And sometimes those experiences are very tender, and, and, but they're powerful and, and in, a, in a great teaching moments. And without them, you know, all it is is kind of talk. Mm-hmm. And, but where, there, where that love is there, you, you get people opening up and being willing to exercise their agency and act. I think that's why the Lord said, above all else, 
clothe yourselves with the bonds of charity. Thank you. Sister Dalton, you have a scripture? I just think that uh, we forget to read on in DNC 88 because I think that is absolutely so true. Um, this love, of creating this environment that fosters spiritual growth and, and the reception of, of, the, of uh, protects the gifts of the Spirit, really. And once that happens, I've seen that happen in young women settings. And when that does happen, the whole group pro progresses together. And the bond, once they leave a young woman setting, is still there. They're bonded forever because of the spiritual growth that they have experienced together and how they've helped one another on that path. So it's really critical. And that's, that's true in missionary work. Uh, Mission investigators typically will tell us as we talk with them what you know as we ask them what was it like as you met with the missionaries the first time they will rarely tell you what they learned but they will always tell you how they felt and and the one of the characteristics that of those who who come into the church is they just felt loved they felt that love from the missionaries and and a, a, I guess a cross-reference scripture to the one that you referred to would be one from Paul where he says, though we speak with the tongue of men or of angels, and we know that angels speak by the power of the Holy Ghost. Sometimes we separate that from this bonds of charity and it's not, that's a false dichotomy. Yeah. And that if we though, we, though we speak with the tongue of men or of angels and have not charity, then we are as sounding brass or tinkling cymbals. We're just noise. We're just talking. I think this is what you said. And, uh, this notion of, of praying with all the energy of our heart that we might be filled as a teacher with this love, uh, which a love he wants to bestow upon all who are true followers of his son. That's, that's really the, the essence of, of this process. And you know, the youth, the youth are noble spirits and they, they perceive that. Yeah, they they know that. They, they know if you're filled with love. They also know if you are a doer of the word. You, you can't be, I don't think you can be teaching the youth and not be a doer of the very things that you're teaching. They, they perceive that. They, uh, they're just a, a, a noble generation and they, they can tell that, yeah. Let me key off of something that Sister Dalton said a few minutes ago about the influence of the world, which we know is, is seems to be ever increasing in a direction we're not necessarily pleased with. What can uh, we do in seminary and institute to help protect our students from the influence of the, of the world? You know, can I respond one more time? As I travel all over the world and I meet with young women groups, I will say, ask that very question, what can we do to help you in your desire to be righteous? And what are we doing that is helping you? And one of the things that is always mentioned that everyone should know is seminary helps. We need that daily, daily connection with the Spirit and with our peers who are also striving. Seminary really helps. So seminary, I think, plays a very important role, especially daily seminary. I think another thing that youth really need to have is, is daily, a habit of daily prayer and, uh, and, daily, and daily scripture study. I think those two things, 100% every day, can really help our students. I had uh, Clark? As Sister Dalton was speaking, I had a, a little memory flash into my mind of, uh, of my own children and their experience in seminary. I think their seminary teachers had a real influence on them. And one way to think about that influence is to um, remember what Enos said when he was in the woods praying and he remembered what his father had taught him and he used a phrase that I think really helps us understand how to keep the world out of the hearts of our children and that is he uses the phrase where he said his father brought him up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and I think those two things are really crucial for seminary teachers especially but also institute teachers where you want to nurture and so you love, you support, encourage, you cheer, you 
love them and they're just great. But you also have the admonition of the Lord. So you set high standards for them. So if, they, if, if you see them as a seminary teacher and they, you, you can tell that the world's in there just by the way they're dressed or how they act, it's good to sit them down, maybe even one-on-one, -on -one, and say, what are you doing? You know, set, set the standards high for them. Love them, but don't let them, don't let them believe that anything's okay. And don't, don't fall prey to the idea that, well, they have their agency, so we don't really need to tell them anything. Uh, we need to set high standards for them. Uh, we want them to become missionaries. We want them to be worthy to go to the temple, to make sacred covenants there, to be uh, an eternal companion to someone, to be great mothers and fathers in Zion. And they, we need to set the standards high. And I think seminary teachers especially have a real impact. There is, there, if you're in the nurture mode, there might be a tendency to want to become their friends and really have them really like you. So you're worried about maybe calling them to account. But I think seminary teachers have a real impact and can set the standards high and say, you know, you, you're a son and daughter of God. Uh, you need to act like it, look like it, talk like it, be like it. Uh, and uh, I think, I think the teachers can really have an impact on kids that way. And that helps them start to see the differences between what the world's trying to do. Because a lot of the effects of the world are very subtle. And uh, we need to help our children see that and choose the right and avoid, you know, slipping down that slippery slope that starts with attitudes and dress and then slips into pornography and off, off into immoral behavior. And, and uh, darkness, and I think seminary teachers can see that. They see the kids every day, they look at them, they can see, they, the Spirit teaches them, this kid needs help right here. You can grab onto them and say, what are you doing? Uh, what are you thinking? So a balance between the nurture and the admonition. Yeah. And hopefully teachers would have that proper balance and not Fall yeah, off either, on either side, either side. exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Know, you very I good. had a personal experience when I was in seventh grade with that kind of thing. I went into the library with all of my friends, and everyone picked out a romance novel and went up to the librarian to check it out, myself included. And she checked everyone out, got to me, and she looked at my book, and then she looked up at me, and she said, I've been watching you. And this is not the kind of book you should be reading, but I have one for you that you should be reading. She reached back and got Pride and Prejudice. Jane Austen. Jane Austen. And she said, you read this book and come back and let's talk about it. Hmm. And just the very, the very realization that someone had been watching me and caring enough that they had already chosen the book that would be, and she, she raised the level of my um, of my taste in that very one thing. I I didn't I didn't know uh, any better really at that point. I, everyone just was re reading was good, and and uh, and she changed me in in just that one moment. So you're right, great President story. Clark. Yeah, great story. <laughs> it is. That's wonderful. You can't say you can't say enough when you talk when you're talking about protecting. Uh, any of us from the world about the importance of daily, personal, meaningful communication with our Heavenly Father in the morning and in the evening and daily reading of the scriptures that, that mean something that, where I connect with the people who are here and what the Lord's saying. And, and what that does is that brings us to the Savior. It brings us to taste of the fruit of the tree of life. And when, and when uh, Lehi tasted of that fruit, his, his experience, he, he tasted, it brought him such great joy, and then he wanted to turn to his family. He wanted others to partake of it. And for me, one of the great keys to protecting ourselves from the, the world is to, is to be on the lookout for opportunities to share the gospel. One of, the, one of the, the points of emphasis is sharing what we learn. And as seminary students and institute students are with others in their high schools and colleges around the, around the world, 
there are abundant opportunities to share what they're learning and to share it from their heart in a spirit of love, not as a preachy, uh, better than somebody else kind of an attitude, but to, to reach out and to share and to testify. And, and that, that experience protects, it protects the individual from the temptations of Satan. And uh, one of the great uh, teachings of the Savior to the, three, to, the, to the Nephites was that you know, he, he recounted how he'd invited all to come unto him and then he commanded his disciples to go and do likewise. And he, then he said that whosoever breaketh this commandment of inviting others to come suffereth himself to be led into temptation. And so the sharing, the sharing notion of the Seminary Institute teaching and learning emphasis is, is as crucial for their protection, I believe, as their as they're praying and reading, but which must happen. You can't, you can't do without that. I, I just love the, the notion of, of Enos because I think there's a, a real model there uh, for all of us, this nurture and admonition, kind of implying a one-on-one -on -one almost relationship that, that then somehow did sink deep into his heart. And, um, and I think that it's wonderful to know that his father also talked to him about an eternal perspective and about the joy, the joy that living the gospel brings. And that caused him to then go to his knees to pray, to repent and want to be pure, and then share, and then share. And then share. So, you know, it's, there are a whole series of things. I think Enos is a rich little book that has a, a, a great model for all of us. I think that's a really powerful idea, too, about the students need models. They need, I think it's one of the reasons why the scriptures are so full of stories, is that we need those stories. We need those models, those patterns to see, basically, this is how God deals with you. And this is how people have come to find him and to come to know the Savior and feel his power in their lives. And, Here's, you know, here's Captain Moroni, and here's Alma, and here's, you know, Elijah, and this story after story after story. It's one of the great things about going to seminaries. You get all these stories, and you see the images, and you, and you start to see this is how you live the gospel. This is how it works, and this is what God does in your life, and it can happen in your life. It's not just some some story that happened a long time ago. This is like right now, real, in your life today. You're going to walk out of here and go to high school, and you can be Captain Moroni. And it's just as powerful now as it was then to, to stand up for truth and righteousness and share with people the things you know are true and rally other people around you and stuff. So I think it's important that, that when we teach, we, we realize we're, we're equipping students with, with power to, uh, to, to live the gospel in a very dark world. Thank you. Another thing I love about Enos, and then you think of Alma the Younger too, they both remembered things their father had said. We don't know how long ago that those statements yeah. were when the seed was planted. Sometimes for some students it grows pretty quickly and for others the teacher may not see it that quickly, but, but the seed is planted and has a chance then under the right situations and experience to grow in their lives. I think that's important for us to remember. We've talked a, a bit about the importance of studying and reading the scriptures daily. One of the key things that we do in seminary and institute is to uh, talk about the scriptures in class. We, that's what we study. What are the advantages or blessings or benefits of studying the scriptures with other people in a classroom setting? And what have you experienced as a teacher or student that made, made those classes come alive and the scriptures come alive? Uh, maybe can I take this one to start with? Please. Because th these, these seminary and institute students then come pouring into the missionary training center. And the first thing they get to do virtually is they get to be sitting down knee to knee with someone and telling them about the scriptures and what they've learned. And, and it's amazing to see the challenge that provides for some. As they have great feelings in their hearts, they have, they have, they have testimonies, they have feelings, but when it's time to express them, they stumble. They they don't know what to. They, they they've never done this before. They 
it's they say everything they know in one sentence and they don't know what to say next and, <laughs> but yet there's so much more inside yes. while others come with a great comfort uh, comfortableness of saying of opening their scriptures and and saying let me let me share there's a question that's a question I've had too and I want to share with you a passage that's helped me and they, they they share the passage as if it were just part of what they've commonly done and that experience, uh, that, that comfortableness can be generated in, in seminary and in institute classes as they talk about these things together. And, and we can see it right away when they come into the MTC. Thank you. Thank you. What, what can, are there things we can do better in that regard to help prepare them so that they don't have to take as long? Or, Well, uh, the, uh, what we're already doing... Uh, I'm just I, I'm thinking right now of an activity in Preach My Gospel. Uh, here it's a it's a great activity about scriptures where it says take select one of these passages below, and then with your companion introduce the passage, provide background and context, read the passage and explain its meanings, explain difficult words, and help investigators apply it in their lives. So what, as I read, what your counsel is to seminary institutes to teachers is to do that very thing. In the classroom, so my counsel would be do it, do it, <laughs> do it because it pays a big dividend, and it uh, it really equips the missionaries from the from the beginning with tools that they will use that will that will bless the lives of not only their lives but the lives of people they teach. And it's a thank you, I, Mr. Dalton. I think one of the great ways that we can uh, help the youth personalize and liken the scriptures to themselves is to help them know that they can have ask questions and they can ask burning questions and that they can receive and find answers through the gift of the Holy Ghost but also going to the scriptures and this can be really practical we had a group of young women come to us who uh, as a general presidency and say so what is a modest swimsuit just tell us show us a picture and we'll go out and buy exactly what you tell us to buy. We'll do that because we want to be modest. We want to do what's right. And I thought about that for a, a, a few minutes. And then I said to them, I can't answer your question because it's not my question. It's yours. You're going to have to find your answer for that question. And we directed them back on a little search. of, And I said, and the answers are all in here. And they, so they embarked on a search. And I said, so you come back and tell us, because we need the answer. <laughs> and they embarked on a search. It took them months, these young women. And they finally came back, and they were just glowing as they shared scripture after scripture that answered their questions. And so I think the more we can allow the youth to ask questions and not negate any question that they ask, and help them use the scriptures to find their answers, that it will change them. It changed these young women. And they all found individual unique answers to their question about what is a modest swimsuit and why is that important for me? I think that's a, this, this, this example is a, is a great illustration of the power of teaching the scriptures in a group where you get people together because the... The, the, the Lord said to the prophet Joseph that because you have the scriptures and because I, they came from me, I gave them, they are my voice. And so you get into classroom and you can, you can get students having heard different voices. And they start sharing and all of a sudden somebody realizes, whoa, I didn't get that out of that scripture. Where did that, how did you get that? And then somebody says, well, this is what, so you realize they, they begin to understand that you bring to the scriptures your own life, your situation, your experience, and your needs. And sometimes the Lord speaks to you in a slightly different way. You get, you see something you didn't see before. And it will happen to you in the group. And then you realize, well, this will happen over your life. You read a scripture differently 20 years from now because your life experience will change. And that opens up to the students this, this realization that the scriptures are this great uh, fountain of living water, that they, you, you read them and they just, they're living. 
they, they keep giving you nourishment and, and sustenance all your life. Even if you've read them a hundred times, they still continue to live because that's how the Lord designed them. And that's, you know, you read them with the Spirit, the Spirit teaches you. So I think if you can teach students that, and that's how you, 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 you read them, you study them, you search them, you use them in your life, and they become this living water that uh, blesses your life forever. Yeah, thank you, thank you. You know, it's an interesting thing to see when that light comes on for students. Many have, uh, have studied in their homes and have had experiences like that, but we have a lot of students across the, the world who, who haven't had that opportunity. And, and when, that, when the scriptures become alive and powerful, uh, you almost see that light goes on in their eyes. And, uh, and there is power there. Thank you. And that's what teachers do. They can help the students see. All you need to do is give them a taste and say, oh, that's how you do that. You, know, you read a certain way, you come at it a certain, with a certain spirit, and it, it begins to speak to you. And that's what teachers help the students do. I think they do that as they testify. And I think, I think that's one of the things that we need to do more and more of. And I don't think testifying is necessarily formal. I think it can be very informal. You can say, oh, I feel so happy today. I went to the temple last night. Let me just tell you. And, you know, and that's really, that's a testimony. And I think the more we can, we can use the power of the word and then testify and testify in every, in every setting, that that also invites the spirit and, and, and does what you say, President Clark and Brother Heaton. Well, I, I'm in complete agreement with what Sister Dalton just said, because as it's, for missionaries, as they share that testimony with their investigators about the, not the institutional uh, position of the church on a given matter, but the personal testimony, the, the witness that's been born to them by the power of the Holy Ghost, and they, they share that, that's what changes lives. That's what invites the Holy Ghost into the life of the person that they're teaching. And, and for teachers, for seminary and institute teachers to do that, for their students, to testify from their heart. Yes, explain what they know and share and help them learn, but then to testify that the Holy Ghost has borne witness to them of the truthfulness of these principles and the impact that it's made in their lives, extending to them the, the, the idea and the hope that God would also reveal to the students those same, those same uh, truths and see how they're relevant. Uh, that's what, I, that's what I would hope would happen in every seminary and institute class every single day. Yeah, thank you. Well, there have been some uh, marvelous insights. I'm frankly excited to, uh, to view this, at least to see the three of you. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering now, as maybe as we come to a close of our discussion today, if, uh, as you have an opportunity now to address seminary and institute teachers across the earth, any final counsel or thoughts or ideas that you would like to share with them about um, the teaching and learning and uh, why that's so important for their lives and uh, why the youth matter so much? Should I start on this one? <laughs> uh, the, I, I know we all have a lot we want to say, but, but for me, I see, I, I see most of my life in the, in the, from the paradigm of the missionary and the person who's trying to come to the Savior. And for a seminary institute teacher to see their students in that same light, the, the, the teacher is for the student what the missionary is for the investigator. And missionaries have a purpose statement from Preach My Gospel that, that fits them perfectly and I think fits others as well. That they see that their purpose is to invite this person to come to the Savior. And they do that by helping them receive the restored gospel. One of the things that I would hope that they would, that I would like to say to seminary institute teachers is that in all that they teach, they're teaching evidences of the restoration of the gospel in our day. That what they, whatever the gospel principle is, we know that not because of study of the Bible, as LeGrand Richards used to say, but we know it because it was revealed in our day through, to a prophet. 
and that the Book of Mormon is evidence of that, and that, that, they, that they instill in their students not just a knowledge of the gospel or an appreciation for gospel principles, but the uniqueness of those principles, that they come to us because of the Restoration. And that the way they'll help their students is by helping them develop faith in Jesus Christ and His Atonement, by, by having enough faith to help them to repent, then to, to make and keep and renew the covenants that are associated with the gospel, starting with baptism and including priesthood and temple ordinances, and all of those are to, so that we can have the Holy Ghost in our life all the more. This, this notion we started at the beginning by talking about agency and cho helping students choose to act, and if teachers can begin in their preparation by saying, what is it I hope these students know and feel and do as a result of what we, we talk about today, to get that, that, that answer clearly in their mind, it will always come back to strengthening their faith in Jesus Christ and His Atonement and those kinds of central principles. They can make a difference, and they do make a gigantic difference in the lives of their students. And their students will call their name blessed for and there will be generations to come where they'll, they'll credit the experience they had at the feet of this, te of this teacher as they counseled and studied the scriptures together that will, uh, that will have changed their lives and countless others as a result. I'd just follow up on what you've just said so beautifully and articulately with the fact that I really think it boils down to the first principles and ordinances of the gospel. And if we teach those things, and Alma taught this so beautifully to his, um, count, in his counsel to Helaman, I'm just going to read a, a couple of things. He says, You shall teach them to abhor wickedness and abominations. Teach them an everlasting hatred against sin and iniquity. Preach unto them repentance and faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Teach them to humble themselves and to be meek and lowly in heart. Teach them to withstand every temptation of the devil with their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Teach them to never be weary of good works. This is that application, that acting that we're talking about. And to be meek and lowly in heart. Remember, learn wisdom in thy youth. Learn in thy youth to keep the commandments of God. And I think that is wonderful counsel for all of us as parents and leaders and teachers of, of the youth of the noble birthright. These are those who have been reserved and prepared to be on the earth now. I think they have a great mission to perform. I think the very, the very purity of their lives will change the world. And thus, I always say to the young women, is, can one virtuous young woman led by the Spirit change the world? And I believe absolutely that the answer is yes, they can, and they will, they will. These are, these are great statements. Um, I would just like to uh, maybe add one thing, and it comes from something that uh, President J. Reuben Clark said a long time ago in a marvelous talk he gave about the charted course of church education, where he he basically said, give it to them straight. Don't, don't try to soft pedal the gospel of Jesus Christ. They want it unvarnished, straight, head on. Teach them true principles and help them by the things we've talked about, become uh, disciples of Jesus Christ, able to stand in their own light, receiving their own revelation through the power of the Holy Ghost so that they can stand as a witness of God and say, I know of my own experience because I have done what the Lord has asked me to do. I've prayed and studied this Holy Ghost has borne witness to me. And so those young people, they become disciples of Christ. And uh, the teachers in seminary institutes can help them do that by teaching it to them straight. Uh, give them the full, unvarnished, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is it. Uh, teach them true principles with power and authority. And 
And if you do it with the Spirit, they'll learn it and they'll get it and they'll have. And I think it's important that we have as an objective that they can stand independent as witnesses of God, um, having been blessed by the testimony of their teachers and their leaders, but actually have had, of having had their own light come because they've lived the gospel. The other thing that's so powerful about seminary institutes is you can, in that setting, help them see that the Savior is real in their lives now. He's in this classroom. They can learn from him and through him, and they can apply his gospel in their lives now. And he's real. His atoning sacrifice has power in your life right now. And that's a really powerful experience. And after they learn to apply that, they'll do exactly what Brother Heaton and Sister Dalton said. They'll become true disciples of the Savior. And uh, all you have to do to have really great confidence in the future is go teach the eight-year-olds in your ward. They're amazing. They are amazing. And it's going to be exciting to have them in seminary uh, and to have them in the universities and in the young women's program, the young men's program as they come through. And think about the missionaries they'll be. This is awesome. Uh, and then the, the promises that are in the Doctrine and Covenants will really see. They will preach the gospel as with the trump, you know, as angels of God, because they know, and they've known for a long time, and they've got strong testimonies. So it's exciting. It's an exciting time to be involved in church education. It really is. This is a season of revelation. The Lord's pouring out revelation on the earth and preparing the earth for his return and it's a great time to be in church education. It is. Thank you. I, th I think that is that's so true. It is an exciting time to be involved in the work of the Lord. Thank you so much for your uh, testimonies, for your counsel. Our desire is to be better uh, as each year moves forward in doing the things that you have counseled us to do and to be more effective in blessing the lives of our students. So thankful for the, we're thankful for the counsel and direction you've given us and look forward to working together. Thank you. Thank you. I'm thankful for the opportunity to meet with you today and grateful that we're joined by our spouses. I hope you've enjoyed the broadcast today. We certainly have been well instructed by Sister Beck and by our panel. It's been wonderful to be here together. I hope that each of our spouses knows how much we appreciate and rely upon your love and support. You play such an important role in any success that we may have. I can't thank you enough for all that you do. I wish I could better express my gratitude for all that each of you are doing to bless the young people of the church. Your efforts are making a difference in individual lives all over the world. I've seen it as I've traveled. A few weeks ago, I met with a group of seminary students in Ukraine. It was a wonderful experience to get to know them. They live in a place where the doors of their country have been opened to the gospel a relatively short time ago. We met at girls' camp outside of Kiev. I asked them what they wanted me to know about them. Three students responded to my question. The first said, we are so blessed. The next said that we are happy. And the last said that we are trying our best to live the gospel. What a privilege, is, privilege it is to work with the wonderful youth of the church. You are blessing them beyond measure as you invite them to come to know the Savior and to live his gospel. Recently, as I was studying our new objective statement, it struck me that everything that we hope will become a part of the lives of our students must first be a part of our lives. If we are to help them, each of us must first learn to fully rely on the teachings and atonement of Jesus Christ. Arthur Henry King, an English professor at Brigham Young University wrote, we symbolize good in a real individual, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He is a man, not a principle, a man who includes all principles. A perfect man is what we are given to follow. We have to study the Gospels, see what Christ did, and try to identify ourselves with what he did. It is because we catch the spirit of the Master and because we have soaked ourselves in the Gospel that we know what it is that we must do. Of the seemingly countless attributes of the Savior, 
I would like to speak about just two of them today. These two characteristics are companions, meaning that we cannot fully achieve one without also acquiring the other. These attributes are demonstrated through the life of Jesus Christ, throughout the life of Jesus Christ, and they are stated clearly in, the introduc in his introduction in Moses chapter 4, verse 2. Behold, my beloved son, which was my beloved and chosen from the beginning, said unto me, Father, thy will be done, and the glory be thine forever. These two attributes, doing the will of the Father and serving with an eye single to his glory, are foundational characteristics of Jesus Christ. From his first recorded words, How is it that ye sought me, wished ye not that I must be about my Father's business? To his last sublime expression, Father, it is finished, thy will is done. His entire life is evidence that his primary desire was to fulfill his Father's will. There was no deviating from his course. All that he did, every decision, every task, was performed to fulfill his Father's will and to give him the glory. Possibly the greatest example of these attributes is found during the Savior's suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland taught this in a profound way. When you get to those supreme and nearly impossible to teach moments of Gethsemane and Calvary and Ascension, remind the students that in this unspeakably wrenching and nature shattering pain, Christ remained true. Matthew said he was sorrowful and very heavy, exceeding sorrowful even unto death. He went alone into the garden, intentionally left the brethren outside to wait. He had to do this alone, dropped to his knees, and then the apostle says he fell on his face. Luke says he was in an agony and prayed so earnestly his sweat became great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Mark says he fell and cried, Abba, Father, Papa, we would say, or Daddy. This is not abstract theology now. This is a boy pleading with his dad. Abba, Daddy, Papa, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Who could resist that? God in his heavens, in his righteousness, for this, the only perfect child he has ever, will ever have, in any knowledge that we have of the plan, who could resist? You can do anything. I know you can do anything. Take this cup from me. That whole prayer, Mark noted, had been that if it were possible, this hour would be stricken from the plan. He says, in effect, if there's another path, I would rather walk it. If there's any other way, any other way, I will gladly embrace it. Let this cup Pass from me, Matthew says. Remove this cup from me, says Luke. But in the end, the cup does not pass. Then he said and did that which most characterizes his life in time and in eternity. The words and the act that made Jesus the Son of God in fulfillment at least according to the great Book of Mormon prophet Abinadi. He said and did what he had to do to become 
the capital S Son of God, he yielded to the will of his Father and said, not my will, but thine be done. I am fascinated by Elder Holland's statement about Jesus that that which most characterizes his life are the words, not my will, but thine be done. If we are to emulate the Savior of the world, it is not enough to fill our lives doing good. We must learn to do what the Father is asking us to do and to do it for his glory and not our own. As a young man, I was blessed to see this principle in the lives of my parents. On many occasions, I watched them make sacrifices to serve our Father in heaven and to serve others. My father was a high school teacher and had summers off from teaching school. During those times, we would find, uh, he would find other work to supplement our income. With nine children and living on a modest salary, his summer jobs were very important to us. As soon as we were old enough, we would be enlisted in whatever job he could find. One year, when I was nine years old, my dad decided to clear the timber on the 20 acres that made up our little farm. We spent the summer cutting down trees and hauling them off to sell to the lumber yard. I don't remember the exact amounts, but each family member that worked was to be given a percentage of the money that was made. We were also given a specific job. Mine was to cut or knock off the limbs of the trees once they had been cut down by my dad or older brother, who were the only ones allowed to use the chainsaws. After clearing off all the limbs, I would carry the poles to the truck where I would help load them with my older sister. By the way, we saw a lot of miracles that summer in the preservation of our family as, as we were new to using chainsaws and hatchets. At the end of that summer, we were then invited into the house to be paid for our entire three months of work. My parents counted out the money, separating it onto a bench for each child, according to the agreed upon percentage. My total share was $60. Being nine years old, that seemed to me to be a lot of money, even for an entire summer of work. After the money was distributed and safely tucked into my pocket, my parents told us that they had recently met with the bishop. He had explained that there was to be a new temple built in, in Seattle, Washington, the state in which we lived. The bishop had asked each family to contribute as much as they could for the construction of the temple. My mom and dad explained that they were going to give all that they could and asked if we could, would be willing to do the same. I knew I would be paying tithing first and I knew that I would need $9 to pay for one pair of jeans that I would need for the coming school year. Then after watching the example of my parents and my older brother and sister, I returned the rest of the money to my parents for the building of the temple. It was an entire summer of work, but I don't remember ever feeling badly about being asked to do that. It's what we did in our family. The choice did not seem like a decision as much as a manifestation of who my parents were and are. They always put the Lord first and they trusted in his promised blessings. Their love for him and for his great work had a profound effect on me from my earliest memories. Lately, I've come to understand these characteristics of the Savior even better as I've watched many of you. I see the way you treat each other as husbands and wives and the way you love your children. Your tireless sacrifices to bless and teach them are wonderful examples of striving to do the Father's will. Some of you have accepted new assignments and even moved your families solely based on your desire to do the will of the Lord. You are unwavering in your efforts to communicate with priesthood leaders and parents and to consistently reach out to students, always lifting and encouraging. You do not waste precious, limited time because your primary desire is to serve the Lord in a way that is pleasing to him. You fulfill difficult administrative assignments without competition, complaint, criticism, or comparison. You work with great enthusiasm to teach the scriptures and the words of the prophets, making sure that you teach what the Lord would have you teach and not what is popular, convenient, or easy. You serve with the needs of your students clearly in mind, seeing each class session as an opportunity to point your students to the Savior. You have responded with eagerness while attending faculty and service meetings, even though for some of you, you've been to hundreds of such meetings before. And all of this 
is because your desire is to do Heavenly Father's will, and that is why you constantly seek learning and inspiration as to how you might bless his children. That requires great humility, and sometimes it requires believing that we can be taught even by someone who we might otherwise think knows less about a subject than we do. President Henry B. Eyring taught this principle when he shared the following experience. When I was the president of Rick's College years ago, I remember having a man who was my priesthood leader come to my house each month to interview me about my home teaching. He brought with him a gray notebook in which he wrote notes. He recorded not only my report as a home teacher, but my observations about the gospel and life as well. I remember at first being very flattered. Then one Sunday, he and I were visiting what was then called Junior Sunday School. He was a few rows in front of me. The speaker was a little girl no more than six or seven, probably not yet old enough to have the gift of the Holy Ghost. I glanced over at the man and noticed with surprise that he had that same gray notebook open. As the little girl spoke, he was writing with as much speed and intensity as he had in the study of my home. I learned a lesson from him that I have not forgotten. He had faith that God could speak to him as clearly through a child as through the president of a college. I watched that man in later months and years deal with great difficulties and with important assignments. I saw miracles, at least to me they seemed to be miracles, in his wisdom and in his ability to lead and to direct. Those miracles, <clears throat> those miracles came, I believe, in large part because he could hear the voice of God confirmed by the Holy Spirit in words of the weak and the simple. The second of the companion attributes that is recorded in Moses 4.2 is serving with an eye single to the glory of God. This is critical. It is critical that we remember that we are teaching Heavenly Father's children and that we must be motivated solely by a desire to bless them and not by any personal recognition or gain. President Lorenzo Snow once told of an official in the church that worked very hard to fulfill his duties. The man showed every outward appearance that he was doing the things he should, but could not find success. Confused by the lack of progress, President Snow went to the Lord in prayer. He la later wrote, My prayer was answered. I found the brother possessed a spirit of self-exaltation, which was directing him in many of his movements. Anxious to promote the cause of God and ambitious to give good instruction, but careful to put his whole name in full length at the bottom of them. Compare the attitude of this man to those described by President Henry B. Eyring as he spoke of the early pioneers who worked unnoticed on the Salt Lake Temple. He said, I was in one of the towers in a place few people would have been since the building was dedicated. In a small room that has rarely, if ever, been used, I saw exquisite pioneer-era woodwork. I remember the sense of awe that came over me when I imagined the workman who had so carefully carved and finished the detailed molding. They toiled away without power tools in a place where, for the most part, only the Lord they loved and heavenly beings would look upon it. They did it not for man or for recognition, but for him, for his house. I know that many of you labor in quiet, seemingly unnoticed ways. How grateful I am to you that you serve so well. You know, your students know, and certainly our Father in Heaven knows that your hearts are consecrated in doing His will. What greater recognition would we ever need than to, than to know we have pleased our Father in Heaven? I would like to close by testifying of just one of the many blessings that come from living these two companion principles. I believe there will be a magnification of love for the Lord and for each other as people unite in doing the will of our Father in heaven. I have seen it in faculties, in areas, and in families. And there is a magnification of capacity that occurs when we forget ourselves and join together in a common cause. As President J. Reuben Clark observed, if you are united, if you will act as one man in carrying out the purposes of the Lord, there is absolutely nothing that can withstand your power. What an incredible promise. I testify that as we unite our efforts in doing the will of our Father in heaven to bless his children, 
Heavenly Father will bless us with an increase in love, an increase in capacity, and an increase in power. There is absolutely nothing that will withstand the power that will come into our lives, our homes, and our classrooms. It will require a humble and willing heart. It will require sincere and consistent prayer. It will require the effort to study the direction the Lord is giving to us and a commitment to apply it in all that we do. Finally, it will require faith that the Lord is willing to give us even more if we will but prepare ourselves to receive it. I know the Lord knows each of us and that he knows when we sincerely want to do his will and to do it for his glory. And just as those wonderful young women in Kiev reminded me a few weeks ago, we are all so very blessed. We have all that we need to be happy. And it is my hope that we will continue to do our best to live his gospel. I bear my testimony that the Lord is in charge. This is his work. Jesus Christ is the savior of the world and the perfect example of what it is to do the Father's will. May we follow him, is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.